to uh, a new series which I'm going to be doing which is all about the CZ1 synthesizer. Now if you've got any of the Casio phase distortion synthesizers then this should be relevant to you um, although my main focus will be as I said on the CZ1. I've had the CZ1 for a couple of years now and it's Casio's flagship CZ synthesizer. And the reason for that is because it's the only one which is velocity sensitive, has aftertouch. All the others didn't have that. So it's, it's worth looking at the history of synthesizers at that time. So Casio's range of CZs came out in the early 80s, starting in 1984 with the CZ 101. Um, synthesizers at that time were very expensive, particularly analog synthesizers. Yamaha had released the DX series in the previous couple of years, which were very successful, but still fairly pricey for the average home user. Um, one of the things that users were particularly interested in having was extended polyphonic keyboards. Up until that time, if you wanted something which could play more than one note and it was cheap, then you needed to get some kind of home organ or something with um, static sounds. Um, having a synthesizer which could play more than one note and was completely programmable would cost you a great deal of money. So Casio's ambition was to produce something that was cheap, but at the same time fulfill that uh, market need. The restrictions they had were that analog synthesizers were very expensive to produce um, and they couldn't use FM because Yamaha had um, copyrighted that. So they came up with their own form of synthesis which was called phase distortion. So looking at the full series then, they started off in 1984 with the CZ101 and this was incredibly cheap. Um, I bought one for £350, but it did have some restrictions. You could only play four notes if you were using both oscillators, um, although you could cut down to one oscillator and then you would have eight notes. Um, the other restrictions was that it was a smaller keyboard which is quite interesting from a modern perspective. People like the smaller keyboards. A lot of people feel the keyboards take up too much space. So the CZ101 is probably more desirable than some of the larger options. But moving on, the CZ1000 was exactly the same as the CZ101, except it had a larger four octave keyboard. Um, then the CZ3000 doubled the voice capacity up to eight voices on dual oscillator. The CZ5000 was pretty much the same as the 3000 except that it had an added sequencer which then brings us to the flagship which is the CZ1 with the velocity and the aftertouch and the extended memory. I'm um, having a quick look at the, the synthesizer then. <clears throat> um, you can see it is probably one of the most um, 80s looking objects that exists in the world. Um, these large keys um, look almost toy town in the way which they are presented. But in terms of usability, that actually makes them really good because, well, you're not fiddling around with some tiny little button. The layout is very logical. On this side we have all of the memories and a lot of performance um, controls. On this side we have all of the synthesis um, and it's logical in the way that it is laid out. So you have oscillator and then tone generation, an amplifier and then use velocity controls at the, the side. There's also a certain amount of effects. So you have a ring modulation, something called noise modulation, and the number of oscillators you're using and how they're combined. This is perhaps a little bit like the 
algorithm you get on a DX synth. Just a quick note on the phase distortion synthesis itself. Now it's, as I say, a unique form of synthesis and the idea is that similar to FM you start with a sine wave but then you distort that into another shape. And when you distort the sine wave you get harmonics. So it's a way of generating the quality of the sound instead of subtracting like you would do with analog synthesis where you use a filter to cut down the harmonics, this is generating them. Um, the other aspect of it is that um, Casio were very conscious that um, the analog filter sound had really sort of caught on and that people liked that. So they found a way to create some resonant sounds as well. And these don't work quite the same way as phase distortion, um, but that's something I'll go into more in um, further parts of this series. Okay, I think it's time to try out a few sounds then. Um, let's have a quick look to see what we've got. This is a sound that I created some time ago. Very simple. Starts with something a bit like an electric piano, and then morphs into a brass sound. I've used this on loads of stuff. I originally did this back on the CZ101 in the 80s, um, but then managed to work out how to recreate it when I got the CZ1. Anyway, that's enough of that. What else have we got here? Basic electric piano. There's an experimental sound I put together. Try and get a proper sort of brass sound. Kind of works, but... Bit of reverb. That's not too bad in the bass, actually. I think you could uh, do a passable brass with that. Let's look at some of the other sounds. So you can do some pretty decent bass sounds in this. Acoustic guitar, they never sound like guitars to me. Etc. shows the, uh, the desire to get some kind of filter sweep on even though there's no filter. No. You can hear how that kind of works there. That's good. Twinkly noises. That's what the CZ is good for. So plenty of good sounds on there. That's it for part one. The next part I'm going to be looking at the sound generation uh, via the oscillators um, and then I'll be looking at envelope shapers 
in a further part and then performance controls as a fourth part. So if you'd like to follow this series then you may want to consider subscribing and obviously if you like what you've seen so far then please consider leaving a like. Hopefully catch you on the next episode and see you then. Thanks very much. Bye.